Uh, I am Rob Sanderson. Uh, I work at Stanford. Um, and uh, this presentation is about uh, the Bib Frame ontology, which is being created by the Library of Congress uh, and our community. Um, and assessing it against best practices from the linked data world. Uh, so as an overview, I'll have a quick linked data refresher. Uh, so what, what is this linked data thing? Um, and how does it differ from RDF? And then go through the uh, best practices which have been uh, defined by the linked data community um, and assess those best practices to see how well they are implemented in BibFrame uh, and to what extent the recent uh, 2.0 updates address some of the concerns um, from those, uh, those best practices. And if you look at the bottom, there's a note 700s versus 500s, which I'm sure is completely opaque to everyone. And if you think about it over the, the course of the talk, uh, there'll be a slight digression, um, but for a point. Uh, and then we'll uh, end with some practical concerns around uh, how we move forwards and actually go from a theoretical ontology to working code. So, a brief refresher around linked data. So linked data um, is uh, RDF underneath. Um, RDF encodes a graph structure rather than a tree. So this makes it really powerful, but also more complex than your traditional tree uh, in that you can have cycles and there's all sorts of other crazy stuff that you need to worry about. Uh, the good thing is that it's a uh, well-respected and long-standing standard within the web community at W3C um, and it follows the web architecture. So uh, if you were at Michael and Herbert's talk uh, or the Fedora 4 presentation, uh, this is one of the underlying um, aspects of uh, a lot of stuff going on at the moment. So in uh, RDF, we have these nodes within the graph. They're identified by URIs which makes them uniquely identified. We don't need to worry about naming things and collisions. Um, it can be both uh, the graph structure, but also data, uh, of course. We need to be able to, at some point, end up with strings and numbers uh, and uh, other structures like that. The nice but complicating thing about RDF is that anyone can make assertions about anything in the world. So I could say that Tom's name is Tom, and uh, that John's name is Fish. So you can also make incorrect uh, or untrue assertions, and that's where some complexity comes in. There are a thing called a blank node, uh, which Karen Estland lovely, uh, gave a lovely description of in the Portland Common Data Model presentation this morning, as, uh, if I may, a soulless but functional uh, part of the RDF data model. Uh, that's a, a very apt description of what a blank node is. And they don't have URIs, so they, they do not really have a soul. Uh, and order is hard. Uh, and I'll emphasize that one. No, honestly, it is really hard. It seems like something that should be easy, you know, one, two, three, but it makes for complexity all over the place. Okay. A couple of years ago uh, at, uh, at CNI, I gave a presentation about um, linked data letdowns, our order is number one on, on that list. Uh, so that was RDF. Linked data, on the other hand, provides uh, best practices for making RDF more tractable and more useful. So it seems like uh, a set of things that we should be looking at and focusing on rather than the RDF uh, underpinnings. So Tim Berners-Lee has four rules about what makes up uh, good linked open data. So the first one is use URIs as the names of things. So if you're going to create a, a thing uh, or, or describe a thing, then use a URI for it uh, to make it globally and uniquely identified. You should use HTTP URIs for those, those names um, so that you can dereference them on the web. So be part of the web, not just on the web, is a, a saying of Herbert's that I often borrow. Now, uh, so when someone does look up those names, you should provide useful information. You should describe what is being looked up. 
And from that description, you should include links to other things so that it's a web, not just a document. So then, really, linked open data provides a more consistent framework than just RDF by itself. Um, in order to have this structure that grows organically, like the web does, that we can all participate in and contribute to, uh, without having to reinvent wheels, without having to re-describe objects and reuse things over and over. So it provides these constraints on RDF, uh, which are not just theoretical, uh, they were derived from real usage and, and watching what happened when people tried to use RDF without these rules. Um, they've been adapted and extended over time, uh, so the best practices that we'll, we'll get to shortly are still somewhat evolving. Um, they're all opinions um, uh, rather than absolute facts, uh, but they're, they're what we have at the moment. The, the nice thing is that um, there is demonstrable improvement uh, for both adoption and usability when you follow the best practices rather than when you don't. So that, that I think, is the, uh, the key point about these best practices. So the two questions then uh, on at least our minds uh, is does BibFrame follow the best practices um, and do the 2.0 updates help? So Ray Denberg, Ray, Ray is uh, one of the folks at LC working uh, very um, closely on BibFrame. Ray knows me from many years back when at my very first 3950 implementers group meeting uh, they were just starting to talk about SIU. Uh, I forget exactly what the issue was, but I, having an opinion, uh, see that uh, something like you, know, you should use a zero based index rather than a one based index um, because blah, blah, blah. Ray very cleverly said, well, hey, if you have you know, thoughts about this, why don't you come and help us make this protocol? It's like, uh, sure, okay, being young and naive not really realizing I was in for you know, 15 more years of standardization. Um, I agreed to do that. So when I raised some issues on the verb frame list, uh, I, I kind of knew what I was going to get myself into. Um, but indeed, uh, I, have, I was invited by LC to, to look at verb frame from the link data best practices perspective. So best practices. The first area of uh, best practices around linked data is to define uh, the domain that you're working in. So William Gibson's Neuromancer is often said to define the domain of cyberpunk. So what does it mean to be cyberpunk is essentially what does it mean to follow in the style of Neuromancer. And that's kind of what we need in the space. We need what does it mean to be bibliographic? What does it mean to be a book? What does it mean to be an instance of a, a work and so on? So the nice thing about having a domain model is that it keeps you honest um, because you can always refer back to Neuromancer or your, your model to say, is this in the model, regardless of how we're going to expose it? And if it's not, maybe we shouldn't think about it. We should let someone else do it because it's someone else's problem. Following from that, uh, we end up with uh, a few points. So first of all, uh, you should define appropriate terms from your domain model. So go through, look at your domain model, what are the, the things that are important, and then define them in, in the ontology. Uh, perhaps more importantly, define only terms from your domain model. So don't expand your scope infinitely. You know, the nice thing about the web is that you can expand out and there's many, many, many zillions of things that you can talk about, but hopefully we can let other people uh, do some of that work for us rather than trying to do it all in our community. Define only one pattern uh, for each feature. So this is also important. I'd like to explain it a little bit in more detail. So in um, any sort of standardization effort, having multiple ways of doing the same thing hurts really everyone. So the producers of the data need to make a choice and freedom from choice is a, a powerful thing. So if you say, you could do it this way or you could do it that way, 
suddenly, oh no, now I need to stop and think, okay, well, what's the benefits of doing it this way? What's the benefits of doing it that way? And if there's no guidance as to which one to use in which situation, you can waste a lot of time and go down the wrong path. If there was only one way, then you would simply do it. You might not like it, it might not fit exactly your own internal mental model, but you'd only have one way to do it, so you would. Who it really hurts is the consumers of the data, because they have to check for all of the possible ways that it can be done on the chance that you made decision A rather than, than decision B, or C, or D, or E, or F, or Z. Right, so if you've got 26 ways of doing one thing, then a client who's trying to import that data needs to understand all of those 26 options, and that's an awful lot of work. So um, that's a, a strong one to, to keep in mind. And then finally, consider dynamic resources in your domain carefully. So dynamic resources would be things like a sensor network that's constantly streaming data. Um, and maybe we don't have that so much in the library domain. Uh, but uh, maybe something like holdings would be the closest approximation, where a book can be checked out, it can be checked in, it can be checked out, it can be checked in. OK, so assessment time. For the first one, defining appropriate terms, it seems like uh, Bill Frame's done a pretty good, uh, good, good job of that. There's work, instance item, title identifier, um, authorities, all of the things that you would expect from a, a bibliographic perspective. Defining only terms from the domain, I, so in my former life I was a, a professor of computer science at uh, Liverpool University, so I'm used to grading things, hence the, the ticks and crosses. Um, not so good. So there's also extension into things like the frame person, place, there's annotations, there's relators, there's resources all over the place. So um, some work could be done there. Uh, define only one pattern for each feature. Also, there's some not quite as extensive as, um, as the previous one, but there are a lot of areas in which there are multiple ways of doing exactly the same thing, so that, that hurts. Uh, and it's really unclear about the dynamic resources. Um, circulation is possibly the only thing that I could find. So no marks either way. Nothing's gone wrong, but nothing's necessarily problematic either. So in the updates, um, however, some very good progress has been made. <coughs> so we still, of course, have the appropriate terms from the <coughs> model. Uh, but uh, some of the additional ones have been removed. So annotation has been taken out uh, in favor of the uh, web annotation uh, working group in the W3C, uh, or the open annotation data model. Uh, relator has come out, uh, but there's still notions of person and place that could be removed more completely. So half a mark, yeah. They find only one pattern. There are still some um, ways of doing the same thing multiple ways, but the majority, so maybe half mark is a little bit um, harsh, maybe it should be three quarters, but oh well. Um, so title versus title statement, um, the multiple ways of doing notes, the multiple ways of doing parts have all been, um, been solved. So that's great news. Um, that will cut down an awful lot of time in uh, the development phases. So uh, an improvement, definitely, in 2.0. Um, going up to two out of four from, from one out of four. Uh, okay, so the, the next area for best practices is using URIs for identity, um, particularly rather than strings. So Michael Nelson um, in the front row often has a, a saying about um, URIs are like kittens, hence the hello, my name is URI, hello kitty. Um, you can get them really easily and really cheaply, but over the long term, they cost you some, some money to maintain. You have to take them to the vet, you have to feed them. No. So um, URIs are really fundamental to linked open data. They're the, the underpinnings of how we have a graph, not just records that stand alone. Um, so that it's worth spending some time on, uh, on thinking about how to best use URIs uh, in our community. So the, the best practices um, use URIs rather than strings for identity. Uh, it comes straight from Tim Berners-Lee. 
the URIs must identify one thing uh, rather than multiple things. So if you had a URI that identified more than one thing, it wouldn't be an identifier anymore, it would be a name. And we don't want names, we want identifiers so that we can be very clear what we're talking about. Uh, use HTTP URIs, again from Tim Berners-Lee's uh, original uh, thesis on, on linked data. Use natural keys in URIs. So this is a, um, one of the more contentious ones, actually. So a natural key uh, is some part uh, of uh, the namespace uh, of, the, of the URI uh, that can uniquely identify the object, but is at the same time somehow a natural identifier. So uh, if you had a, um, a subject or a, a property, um, let's say a, a property, so the best practice would say you should use some name for that property in a namespace, ensure that it's unique, but don't use some arbitrary random set of characters for the name, such as, for example, RDA does with P1001, meaning title. Just call it title. Our clients should treat URIs as being opaque. Don't try to drill into the URI to make um, further assertions about parts of it. Just use it as a, um, a single atomic hole. Uh, and avoid dates and hash URIs uh, as much as possible um, for reasons mostly around uh, dynamic data. So if you have a, a date in your namespace, uh, which one of the main ontologies does, uh, FOF, friend of a friend, um, then, or, or a version number, in FOF's case actually, it's 0 0.1, you are stuck with that eternally because everyone's using it, and you don't want to mint a new URI just to change those three characters. So even though FOF is one of the most stable and most widely used ontologies, <coughs> if you look at the URIs, they still claim to be 0 0.1, even though it's really 6.5 or some other you know, uh, crazy uh, version number. So don't, don't put uh, dates and version numbers in URIs unless you really know what you're doing. And don't use hash URIs because the hash part, so the fragment, never gets sent to the server. So if the server wants to do something clever for you, it won't know that you're asking for it. So avoid them if possible. All right. So four out of six for the score. It's a little bit charitable because the failures are the first two, which are the big ones. So on using URIs rather than strings um, in, in the first bib frame uh, version. There's a, quite a lot of use of that, uh, especially around authorities. So for example, uh, the assigner of uh, an authority is just a, a string, where it could be a URI that would reference a, um, an organization. Uh, URIs must identify one thing and only one thing. Uh, there was a couple of areas where that wasn't followed, which would make things tricky. So one URI would identify both the resource and the metadata about the resource. So that that's problematic. Uh, and parts in VibFrame, you couldn't really distinguish the part from the whole uh, because of the way that uh, especially language of part was associated with the, the resource. On the other hand, um, Nice green ticks for use HTTP URIs. Maybe blank nodes are slightly overused, but um, that's okay. Uh, use natural keys in URIs. All of the examples in the ontology is very good on this, this aspect in particular, um, compared to RDA, which goes in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, and from my perspective, has suffered from, from doing so. Uh, a blank node is the soulless but functional thing that doesn't have a URI itself, um, so you can't refer to it uh, from external sources. You can only refer to it within a single document. Um, but otherwise, is a node in the, in the graph. It's just, it's called blank because it doesn't have a URI. So the reason to avoid them is if someone else wants to refer to the resource that, you've, that you haven't given a URI to, they can't. Um, so you can't have links in to blank nodes um, from, from outside uh, the document that, um, that generates it. 
So if you had a blank note for a person, and someone else wanted to say, this, per this person is the author of my work as well, you'd have to create a new resource, and you couldn't link the two together. So then your linked data suddenly just goes back to being siloed records um, across the board. So thank you, it's a good question. Yep. Um, treating URIs as uh, as opaque is good. There's no URI construction. There's no semantics in the <coughs> URIs, so that's that's what, that's good. Uh, and dates and hash URIs are successfully avoided. So four out of six. But I note that it's slightly charitable because the top one is the main point of linked data. So across there, if you were going to be a, have a weighted assessment, you might want to count it for two or something. However, in the updates, there has been great improvement. So uh, there's many fewer uses of strings for identity, and in particular, um, not in the authority space. Uh, so there will be real URIs that identify the subject um, and the, the real place rather than the authority record about the place. So that's fantastic news. Uh, both of the, the issues around URIs identifying one thing um, are gone. Uh, so the resource versus metadata issue has been resolved, as have the parts. So also good news. Um, and no reversions have happened. So five and a half out of six is slightly charitable, uh, because the first one is, is still important. But yeah, really, really good progress. OK, so the, the next one, um, and the, the quote here is from Rufus Pollock uh, of the Open Knowledge Foundation that the, uh, the person who will do the most interesting thing with your data will be someone else, uh, it won't be you. And the only way that they can do that is if you provide the information to them, of course. So uh, provide useful information when your URI is requested uh, from, from Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, describe your own resources. So by this, I mean don't go off and describe someone else's resources if they've already described them and you don't have anything to add. Um, if you've got something to add, great. Uh, that's, that's totally fine. Um, but don't just arbitrarily mint new URIs for things that already have URIs, just link to them. Uh, and describe your own resources individually. So don't create one big document that has a zillion things in it because people won't be able to request it as easily as if you'd had them separated out. So maybe someone cares about Lord of the Rings uh, and Tolkien and all the characters and they don't care about um, Philip K. Dick and his stories. So don't make one huge catalogue with everything in it. Make resources individually um, with descriptions uh, provided by HTTP. Include links to other resources, again from Tim Berners-Lee, uh, and another slightly contentious one is maybe changing uh, in the, the coming uh, year or, or few. Avoid three aspects of RDF that have not been well liked. Uh, reification, lists, and blank nodes. So blank nodes we've, we've covered. Lists is that order problem. It's really, really hard. Um, due to some of the technical underpinnings of RDF. Reification uh, from ray, race, uh, thing in Latin. So making something which isn't a thing into a thing. Um, so in this case, it's turning a, a relationship into a resource that represents that relationship. And there's a particular way of doing that in RDF, which people recommend not doing because it makes querying much harder. So, uh, provide useful information. Um, top one is great. It's uh, promoted for the main classes. Um, identifier needs a little bit of attention. What does it mean when you dereference an identifier? Should you get the thing that is identified, or should you get a description of the identifier? So that's uh, it's a bit of a semantic conundrum, uh, really, at that one. Describe your own resources and describe them individually. Uh, it's not really discussed because it's more of a protocol aspect for implementers. Um, annotations could do with some attention uh, in, in the space. So no, no cross, but a, uh, no tick either. 
include links to other resources, so this is not well done. Uh, there's only internal references rather than external. So for example, uh, there is a bib frame uh, way of uh, expressing language that doesn't point out to the very well-known set of languages um, that are available in like, data. Uh, so you can't say, this book is of language English, and then go off and follow your nose, find the description of English, and get all of the labels for English in all of the different languages that uh, the, the Lingvo community has already provided. Uh, avoid reification lists and blank nodes. Reification uh, is related in BibFrame um, 1.0, which is pretty much reification. It's not exactly the um, W3C way of doing it, but it's a reinvention of it. Uh, there aren't any lists, uh, but there are lots of blank nodes everywhere in the examples that could be um, improved. So two out of six may be slightly uncharitable, given that um, one of them's a, a dash. All right, so how do we do in the updates? Um, another, another tick. So uh, it's still good for the main classes. Identifier got the attention that it needed. It's been clarified, so that's great. Um, annotations got the attention that they needed, so that's also really good. Um, so yeah, the annotations are now going to be the W3C annotations, uh, so following the standards. And um, the use of annotations within the model has, uh, is being clarified as to why, when you would want to do that rather than when you would want to just create more triples in the, uh, in the descriptions themselves. Uh, there's still only internal references, however, that didn't really change, um, other than annotations, uh, which is only a very small part anyway. Um, there's still some reification. This is maybe also slightly harsh. Uh, so there's contribution in the new updates, which reifies the relationship between a work and a person to say what their, the person's contribution to that work was which actually seems pretty reasonable. So I, I think that, that cross is, is slightly harsh. I thought about this on the, the flight over, but I already submitted the slides uh, for the recording. Um, lists still aren't used, and blank nodes are, are still everywhere. So again, improvement, three out of six. Um, still, still some work to be done, but, but getting there. Okay, uh, reuse existing work. Um, so, I, I think everyone understands the value of standing on the shoulders of giants uh, rather than reinventing things. Um, so the, the first one, reuse existing vocabularies. Uh, where they exist, don't go out and uh, reinvent everything. Um, define, and actually I'll continue on that, that thought. Uh, that's one of the principal notions of linked data, that in order to have interoperability, if we reuse the semantics that other people have already defined and implemented and use, we get a huge amount of benefit because we don't have to relearn all of the semantics for a new set. We, don't, we can re reuse existing code. When we're trying to align models, it's trivial because we're using exactly the same properties. So that's, I want to uh, underline that one. That's, that's the important one to, to get right. Uh, define terms in your own namespace. This is pretty easy, so don't uh, try to create a new Dublin Core label because you don't control the Dublin Core namespace. You should create a new ontology and put your stuff in your own ontology. Uh, relate new terms to appropriate existing ones. So if you create something that is similar to or a refinement of something that already exists, you should relate it back to that thing that already exists so that people know um, what that relationship is. So if they understand that uh, your bib frame title is somehow related to Dublin Core title, they know what Dublin Core title means, then they can at least have an approximation of what you mean by bib frame title. Uh, name terms consistently. So don't simply go through and have uh, random names uh, for everything, have a way of building up uh, the names of things in the ontology uh, consistently, concisely, uh, and predictably. So that when someone sees is part of, 
they know that which direction the relationship is going, they know that its part is the important bit because um, it's not has part. But if you just had part as the name of the relationship, you wouldn't know whether it was is part of or has part. Um, there is some rules that have been uh, refined in the space uh, in the linked data world, such as if it's a property um, of an object, so like a title, uh, then use a noun. And if it's a relationship between resources, then use a verb phrase. So uh, is part of a verb phrase, so X is part of Y. Um, or title as a noun, not has title, um, because it would be work, title, value. Uh, related back to the first area, only define what matters. So don't go overboard and define things that are um, unnecessary to define. And one of the things that matters is uh, inverse relationships, uh, because then you can tell how things are related backwards. So an inverse relationship, sorry, uh, if is, is part of versus has part. So those are inverse relationships. So if x is part of y, then y has part x. Yep. So if you have one, then you can infer the other. So that's, uh, that's important. OK, so how do, we, how do we do? So unfortunately, the first one um, is fundamental and ignored. So a lot of the BIB framework uh, is not um, reusing existing uh, vocabularies. It recreates them. So there's a BIB frame place, there's a BIB frame resource, there's a BIB frame person, there's a BIB frame work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a BIB frame title. You name it, it's, it's, it's not uh, reused. Um, defining terms in your own namespace, well, yes, but uh, not to damn with faint praise, but if you are going to define everything in your namespace, then you are clearly defining stuff in your own namespace. Um, new terms are not particularly well related um, outside of BibFrame. There's a few, uh, but not many. <coughs> They're not named very consistently, uh, and they don't follow the best practices, or, and sometimes they don't even follow the internal conventions. It's rather over-engineered. Uh, it's some hundreds of classes and many hundreds of properties and relationships. Uh, and there's only inconsistent inverse relationships to find. So I think this area is the one where there is the most work to do. Um, but thankfully, there is some improvement um, in the updates. So it's unfortunately uh, still ignored. Uh, the updates don't really say you should use um, RDFS label or other things, there's still, um, or there are no new ones uh, added. It's still somewhat pack praise. Um, the good news is that the term consistency improves uh, quite a lot. Uh, there's some, um, they you know, are starting to follow the best practices there. Um, and uh, the Definition of what matters uh, is uh, before is also improving. Um, so, yeah, inverse relationships still reasonably inconsistent, but definitely, definitely improvement. So again, um, maybe slightly charitable, but uh, but good. Okay, so overall, uh, a a cheery <coughs> note that. It is improving. There's still a lot of work to go, but it's improving. Um, so if we do the, the simple math, uh, currently 8 out of 22, or 36%, it's not great. Um, however, with the updates, it, it gets to 57%, which seems like a passing mark. Uh, it's at least greater than 50%. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, Perfection is the enemy of the good enough. We don't need to aim for 100%. 100% would be great. But at least if we can keep incrementally improving, um, so much the better. So the areas where work is still needed, um, reuse of existing ontologies and vocabularies is clearly the, uh, the biggest uh, bugbear. 
uh, more consistency in the design. There's been improvement in this space. Uh, that improvement could be rolled out across the ontology in general. Uh, more linking. Um, so the benefit to the community of adopting bib frame and link data is this web, is this uh, links between resources rather than just the syntactic transformation of Mark into RDF. So if we can generate links between resources and in especially between institutions, um, that is where we are going to generate the most benefit from this um, transformation in the community uh, rather than just the syntactic one. So making that easier and promoting it I think would be beneficial to the community and to the, the ontology. Uh, and finally, drop the remaining strings that provide identity. Uh, that's simply not what linked data does. If we want to do it right, we should do it right the first time, because this is going to be expensive to do over and over again. Yeah. Okay, so, a slight diversion. 700s versus 500s. Who has any idea what I'm going on about? Who hasn't seen this presentation before? <laughs> okay, it's so less, all right. So, so uh, some people need hints. Right, it is not added entries versus notes. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. If you thought that, then no, sorry. This is what it is. It's uh, SH8500824 versus eight, SH8511853. Did that help anyone? <laughs> no, no, I didn't think so. Does this help anyone? It's Dewey 700s versus Dewey 500s. Who knows their Dewey off the top of their head? Anyone? No. So my meta point is um, uh, natural keys. We, it, it could have been useful to have some, some strings in there that could be read by humans. Um, but we as a community are very focused on numbers and, and identifying things. Does that help? in terms of identifying the, the two things that 700s and 500s might be. No. All right. So arts versus sciences. So the, the Dewey um, subjects, uh, arts were in 700 and sciences were in 500. So the point being, they're more like guidelines uh, from the Pirates of the Caribbean. That, uh, this is all a black art. There is no hard science around any sort of assessment, especially not around best practices, and in particular not in linked data. So this is all the opinions of Rob Sanderson and should be taken in that context. Those opinions are somewhat validated by the Linked Data for Libraries project um, and somewhat validated outside of that in the best practices community, but they are, at the end of the day, um, my opinions which are subjective. Uh, there are no unbreakable rules. The contribution is a good example of when you would want to use ratification. Uh, there, are blank, there are use cases for blank nodes where you would never want to refer to them, uh, and so on. And in particular, something that would be valuable to do uh, is to consider a context of the ontology and how it's expected to be used. So focusing on the areas that provide the most value and making sure that they are easy to use, easy to understand, um, and follow the best practices will gain us a lot uh, in the not too distant future. Okay, so, uh, on from the ontology assessment and into more practical concerns. So the two areas of practical concern are the documentation and the implementations. So the documentation uh, is uh, reasonably deep um, at the moment. Uh, it's much better than some other ontologies, actually. Um, however, it's not really sufficient uh, for third parties to develop um, good implementations because it's hard to see how each term should be used. You know, what's the purpose of having this in the ontology? And the difficulty there is um, there is many, many, many years, as we know, of uh, bibliographic description history which has been assumed on top of this um, or underneath this, depending on your perspective, um, rather than trying to explain things from a neutral standpoint. 
So the documentation needs to be updated, of course, with the updates uh, and maintained. Um, I think LCU have done a stellar job in moving in this direction and certainly, as I say, better than other ontologies. Uh, it, it is really appreciated and it is a huge amount of work because the ontology is equally huge. Um, then, in terms of implementation, the thing which is going to help uh, the community the most is transformation engines to go from our existing catalog data into BibFrame. Uh, and again, LC has done a stellar job in providing such a, an implementation. Um, uh, at least in the Link Data for Libraries project, we've used uh, the LC converter a lot. Um, at Stanford, we have it hooked up to our catalog. So for any change to a mark record, you can instant, instantly see it reflected as BibFrame to see what that change um, uh, results in. So at Stanford, um, we've wrapped it for also some local improvements. So we have um, a bunch of VIAF links um, and other similar references outside of our catalog, which the LC converter doesn't know about, of course, because it's our internal data structures. So when we run our raw data through the converter, they end up either getting lost or getting appended to the previous um, field both of which are uh, suboptimal, of course. So we put a wrapper around that to add, uh, to mess with the mark on the way in and mess with the RDF on the way out to get those uh, added in. Uh, Cornell, one of the other LD4L partners, also has changes, as I guess pretty much every institution does. Um, so they wrapped it differently. Um, so they made some improvements to the ontology. Um, Harvard wrapped it for their purposes and so on and so on which is fine from a uh, perspective of here is one institution doing one small thing, but if we wanted to use the uh, improvements to the ontology from Cornell or from Harvard or from Maryland or from anywhere, we would need to somehow wrap an already wrapped thing and you end up with a huge present with you know, a marble in the middle and you know, paper around the outside for, um, for meters. So that's not going to be sustainable um, over the long term. There's also the BibFrame Lite converter, which I will subsequently discard from all um, the, from the presentation because it doesn't actually implement BibFrame. It's BibFrame Lite, which is, has the same name, but it's about the only similarity. So this is if you're as fork, essentially, of the ontology. Okay, so the conversion utility that we have now from LC is written in XQuery, uh, which is really well suited to XML processing, but as I said at the beginning, RDF is not a hierarchy, it's a graph. Um, we should be using the right tool for the, for the job. So it has a very limited community and it has limited functionality. So in terms of uh, being able to extend uh, the existing converter, there's going to be some areas where it becomes impossible and areas where it's very, very hard. Uh, it was a, a mammoth effort um, from LC to produce it, so of course you can't have time to do everything, but there is a lack of tests, so you can't tell after you've changed that, you can't run a test to say, did I, did I mess it up? Um, does it still produce the correct result even after my change? Um, so that makes it tricky to extend. And there's also minimal documentation, either from an end user or from a developer's pers perspective. So it makes it hard to use, it makes it hard to, to develop with it. Um, again, again, due to the necessity to get something out, it's somewhat inflexible. So we had to wrap it in other code in order to make our local enhancements, rather than get in and change the code um, directly. It, that makes it difficult to keep up to date. So with the uh, changes to the ontology, there's probably only one or at most two people in the world who can update the converting code, whereas it should be developers from all of our institutions contributing um, towards that. Because it, at the end of the day, we are all going to need this code. We are all going to have to run this to get to um, the, the web of linked data, and hence we should all be participating in ensuring it's um, done correctly and effectively and well. 
So from our assessment um, at Stanford, it's insufficient to go to production um, using uh, the LC converter um, because we'll need to rerun it repeatedly. The mark data will change, uh, the ontology will change, the code will change. So if we can't be sure because of lack of tests and so on that it's working correctly, we can't go through and do qualitative assessment of 8 million mark records every time we want to rerun it. So we don't know how we could be confident that what is happening is correct. Uh, we know that we'll need to handle enhancements, so we have many internal uh, conventions, but also some external um, additions, such as the links to VIAF, that we actively pay third companies to do. So we can't just pay them, import it into one, and then have it disappear into the ether, because now we've lost our money. Um, we need to customize up local practices, we need to know when it doesn't work and what needs to be fixed. Uh, and as, as I was uh, saying before, we should be sharing um, the development, the configuration, and the understanding. Um, so if we have a configuration that works well for us, it would be great to be able to say, hey, um, Harvard, uh, hey, Columbia, here is what we've done, here is our changes, uh, this worked for us, you could run it and tell us if it works for you. Um, so some desirable uh, features for conversion. Uh, number one, it should be developed by us. It shouldn't just be on LC to provide a single um, monolithic piece of, of software. Um, it should be well documented, it should be testable and auditable uh, to make sure that changes haven't broken anything. Uh, it should be efficient. You know, we have big catalogs, maybe the mark records are small, but there's going to be a lot of processing done to get to good linked data where we've reconciled the you know, Tolkien from The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and uh, the movies. Right, if we want to go to just beyond author uh, into uh, the relationships between works, then having those, that sort of information available with URIs to identify um, uniquely people and works is going to be crucial. Uh, configurable, so we shouldn't have to monkey with the code directly to be able to change features, turn them off and on, robust, so it shouldn't break, uh, or if it does break, it should break gracefully and tell us, hey, I couldn't process this record because you've got this dollars dagger weird field and I don't know what it means, so I'm gonna back out and, and not do anything, but it shouldn't just explode and, uh, and take all of your data with it. Uh, it should be integrated or able to be integrated with local systems, so we need to be able to hook it up to our ILS, of course, but also if we have an identity management system, we should be able to hook it up to that to say, okay, the identity of this person is over there, go and find it. And one that I missed off the slide, it should be, it should provide happiness to developers to work with it. <laughs> or at the very least it shouldn't you know, result in um, revolutions from developers who throw their hands up in the air and say, I can't deal with this anymore, please, please make it stop. So how to get there, um, of course, thoroughly documenting the ontology is the first step, and I know that that's being worked on. The, the point though, if it's too hard to document it, which is just writing English, then it's probably too hard to implement. So yeah, keeping it to the point where the documentation is reasonable, we'll keep it to the point where implementation is also likely to be reasonable. Um, there's been these uh, proposals uh, for updates to 2.0. Uh, it would be great to have a uh, more community focused oriented method so that we could all say, hey, this is what we think. Here is a specific change rather than just arguing back and forth on the verb frame list. Um, to yeah, get uh, additional updates and, and feedback around the existing ones. I document the transformation processing algorithms. So at the moment, um, the only way that you can figure out how to get from mark to verbframe is to look at the output of the converter as opposed to looking at documentation to say this is what the converter does. So it would be great to get some of the sort of internal processing algorithms so that they could be re-implemented in Python or Ruby or Java or whatever you happen to, to want without having to do the mental gymnastics that have already been done in the current converter um, to uh, know what to do. 
uh, engage with the community to determine requirements um, and make it possible for stakeholders to impl implement their own patterns. So again, everyone has local practices. It needs to be easier to uh, make those local practices reflect into the, the bib frame result. Uh, and crucially, seek partners for development. LD4L, LD4P is keen to participate. But that's just one project and the whole community would benefit from um, developing this together. So, uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you want to read the 50-odd page report that I sent to LC, uh, no, there's no tickets, but anyway, if you do, uh, <laughs> the top link is for you, uh, Bib Frame Analysis. Uh, and these slides are on SlideShare, so you can refer to them later, uh, CNI15F underscore Bib Frame for, for Bitly. Um, a lot of this work was discussed and has come out of the Linked Data for Libraries project. If you did not attend uh, Dean and Tom's presentation yesterday, uh, it would be great to go to ld4l.org. You'll see what we're, what we're working on. And finally, if you have any questions or comments that you would like to send to me uh, that maybe you, you think up on the way home, uh, azeroth42 at gmail or azeroth at stanford um, will get to me. So, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>